Well, it was uh, Socrates that once said, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become very happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. But uh, that's kind of the, uh, a lot of that hasn't changed in terms of, uh, of uh, a look of marriage, uh, you know, even in our, our current uh, state that we're in. Uh, there's a lot of people that think that the key to marriage is finding that right person. But really, the key to marriage is becoming the right person. You know, once you, once you are, are married and uh, allowing the Lord to work and change in you, sometimes as we're meeting with uh, young couples, Kathy and I will tell them the fact that, uh, you know, in a sense, your, your relationship is like this little, little campfire that if you don't continue to stoke it and <laughs> blow on it and, uh, and uh, pile more wood on the fire, those kindles will just seemingly uh, go out after some point in time. Relationship has to be worked on. Uh, uh, came across this quote from the uh, Merchant of uh, Venice, and no, I don't read a lot of Shakespeare, but uh, I did forward this on to, to Josh, who was an English major, and read Shakespeare for uh, light airplane reading, but uh, a very, <laughs> very unusual taste and um, quite the intellect when it comes to literature. But uh, I thought he might appreciate this, this line uh, in regards to his upcoming marriage. Uh, here... The, the speaker is talking about his love for someone else, and he says, For she is wise, uh, if I can uh, judge of her. And fair she is, if that mine eyes be true. And true she is, as she hath proved herself. And therefore, like herself, wise, fair, and true, shall she be placed in my constant soul. That's the idea of what God's got in mind here in terms of our love one for another. In the context of marriage, the idea of that person being placed in our constant soul. And it really is a spiritual dynamic that we're talking about in terms of marriage, much more than just the love that we would see popularized in the, in the media and so forth. As we kind of jump into this and as we just in the media here in our own state, uh, are facing and uh, have uh, just enacted uh, a uh, piece of legislation that will eventually, through the courts, lead to uh, same-sex marriage as we join a few other states in the country. Let's just state the obvious, and I'll do that with a quote from, Quint, uh, from Kent Hughes. He says, monogamous heterosexual marriage was always viewed as the norm from the time of creation. The account is about Adam and Eve. There is no Adam and Steve. Legislators who would legitimize same-sex marriage, giving it the punitive status of heterosexual marriage, are attacking a creation ordinance and are reproaching God himself. What, uh, uh, what a, a, a bit of Dante's terror awaits such presumption. God will not be mocked. Dante's terror is, a, is a, basically a poem talking about how terrible hell's going to be. But uh, we live in a day where marriage is under attack, its status, its ordinances, its privileges, uh, but God has put it into the plan of man and woman right from the beginning. Notice he's the initiative of everything. Verse 18, the Lord God said. Verse 19, the Lord God formed. Verse 21, the Lord God made. Uh, the emphasis in each case is the Lord God and what he did. And we got introduced to that title last week. Up until the creation account, it was uh, Elohim. It was God that did everything in terms of speaking creation into existence. But uh, now when we begin to talk about the creation of man, as we did last week, Moses interjects uh, the term Yahweh Elohim. Uh, again, because we're to remember the God as the creator and as our redeemer. And we went through that, but also then he uses the covenant name, the name that was attached to God and his relationship with the people of God in terms of Israel. And certainly we're under the new covenant now, but as we read this in our Bibles, uh, that capital L, capital O, R-D, uh, God, Yahweh Elohim, it should remind us of he is our creator, he's our redeemer, and we have a covenant relationship with him as well. And he gives us instructions here, we would say, that are primary and vital to human existence. Well, let's look at verse 18. God will provide a helper for Adam. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So 
Uh, the, the obvious statement that uh, maybe some would not agree with, most of us that have been married for a while and our wife goes away for a week or a weekend, we would say amen to this. It's not good for man to live alone. <laughs> we find ourselves in a, a lot of trouble very quickly. And this is in contrast to uh, God saying, creating something and saying, and it was good. And then the second day, and it was good. And this repeats six times. He gets to man and, is, and then abruptly says, and this is not good. <laughs> it's, it's the not good section that, uh, uh, that we're looking. And it's not good uh, that he be alone. And this is, again, a contrast between the wisdom of the world and what God says uh, about man. Uh, the world says that man can live independent, should live a self-reliant life, and, uh, and so forth. But actually, God designed us for personal relationships. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. And he built us and designed us to relate to one another, not to live an isolated life. Uh, after the fall, we'll see that man lives for self-gratification. And the basis for relationships for him then becomes self-centered and for self-gratification. There's, there's a lot of people that are out there that want to have a relationship with someone else because of what that person can do for them. Uh, and that's not what it was from the beginning nor what we're talking about here in terms of God's view of companionship uh, and of marriage. And the results of that kind of relationship of self-gratification is always damaging. Self-respect, self-worth are lost because of the self-centeredness that comes as a result of the fall. And, uh, and there's a contrast between the idea of self-esteem and self-worth. We have tremendous self-worth because, again, imagio Dei. We're all made in the image of God, uh, and uh, that's why we have worth. It's not because I'm so great and I'm so good and I can do for me, uh, which is kind of the, the mantra of the world today. One is self-centered, the other is God-centered. Secondly, God will provide a helper, though. It's not good that man's alone, so there's a helper that is comparable to him. Helper, uh, again, becomes the basis for the relationship. It actually speaks of not what I can get, but what I can give to the, to the relationship. Nobody enters a relationship and says, how can I help you? If they want something from you, well, maybe they do if they're real slick salesmen or something. But uh, again, the very phrase speaks to the fact of what God intends for relationships. It's others oriented. Uh, this word here in the Hebrew is uh, azar, and it means suitable. It means the opposite, specifically a counterpart. Uh, it's, it's like God's a created man and there's things missing in his life and so he brings the counterpart that will complete both man and woman. The function of helper is complementary, a helper fit for him or literally like the opposite of him or according to the opposite, the corresponding counterpart, uh, male and, uh, and female. And again, not that there's uh, anything uh, belittling in this term at all, it's actually the term that is used of God himself as the helper of Israel on several occasions. When uh, it talks about the deliverance from Pharaoh, example in uh, Exodus 18.4, it refers to God as the helper who delivered Israel from, from Pharaoh. So the term itself, it's like helper. I don't know if I like that word. No, it's, it's certainly, it, it, it's, it's a, a position of the counterpart of, of man. The two people live their lives in interdependence on one another. I, I've been, I remember when I was still working at Safeway, uh, I'd be checking out somebody's groceries. It'd be a husband and wife, a young couple. They'd come through, and then the bill would come up, and then they would uh, calculate, and he would take out his checkbook, she would take out her checkbook, and they would both pay for half of the groceries. And I'm, I was just a young guy in my 20s, and I'm thinking, pretty sure my mom and dad never did that. But, uh, I mean, it, it, it's this idea that somehow you can remain independent and have your independence and this marriage relationship is going to work uh, and nothing could be further from the truth we're meant to be the counterpart and the complement to one another and we're to live actually a complete interdependence on on one another secondly uh, God presents here the need for that comparable helper it's interesting how he does that in verses 19 and 20 out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, 
to the every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So first notice the process. God presents the need to Adam by having him name the creatures. Now this Adam wasn't uh, Dr. Doolittle on steroids or anything. He's not singing like a, like a Disney movie and the animals are talking to him. He's not like they're going by, I think I'll call you yeah, elephant. Hey, you look like a giraffe to me. And you know, what would you like to be called little little guy. Oh, chimpanzee. Oh, that's not it at all. I mean, this is talking about the, the sovereignty that God has given to Adam. And when, uh, when God is creating, he calls, uh, he calls uh, you know, this part of the, uh, of the atmosphere day, this part night. It's, he's, we're, we're being introduced to this idea that he's naming things because he has sovereignty uh, uh, over them. And uh, and will rule over them. So he then gives this responsibility to to Adam. And the, it's the idea that Adam looks and then gives careful consideration to what he's seen. And he's trying, we're, we're speaking, I'm sure he wasn't speaking English. I don't know what language Adam spoke, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't English. Uh, but he's, he's coming up with names that are appropriate for who these animals are. In other words, he's got to look at them and observe them and understand them to some degree so that he can name them some name appropriate to them. Kyle and Dielitz in their classic work says it was, uh, it was a deep and direct insight into the nature of the animals that uh, Adam is actually naming them and it penetrates far deeper than, than uh, surface knowledge or more simple reflection. Notice also in verse 20, so Adam gave names to all cattle, uh, again, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field, but there's the contrasting term, but, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So apparently, as he's watching and going through this process, God is using it to bring an awareness to him of some need that he had. No, in a sense, Adam had no needs. God had provided. He's in a paradise situation. He's in a perfect relationship and harmony, not only with his environment, but with God himself. Uh, he's, he's not looking around and thinking, I don't see a lot of women around this part of the garden here. You know, the, the concept is not there. It does not exist. Uh, but God then brings through a process an awareness as he notices apparently based on the text as these animals and it says God brought them before him and uh, obviously more than likely not every animal on the planet but those localized to the garden and where he was uh, uh, living at the time he brings them along and apparently they came by in pairs they came by and he notices there is no companion comparable for him that apparently he sees in the animal kingdom. And so God uses this to, to show him a need that he was not aware of uh, uh, prior to this. The third thing is God demonstrates now purpose in the creation of the woman. In verses 21 to 23, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, he brought her to the man. And Adam said, first words spoken by a human being in the Bible, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So there is a purpose uh, really even in the process of the way that God creates woman. Now remember, Adam is from the dust of the earth uh, and uh, is what his name uh, even means it was Ha Adam, the dust. He's called dust. Remember, we said we could nickname him Dusty. But uh, here, woman is not created that way. She is created very differently. Obviously, God could have done it the same way. But he chooses now to take woman out of the man. Kind of the, the classic uh, correspondence, uh, or excuse me, the classic quote on this is from Matthew Henry. Doesn't always get the credit, but the great Puritan preacher said, that God did this, that the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. So it seems that there's intent. He shows Adam his need for a companion, he puts him into a deep sleep, and even in the process of how that comes about, that uh, there's uh, intention there in terms of the relationship uh, itself. 
And Adam's response, as one writer says, was a shout of ecstasy. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And even uh, the words that he uses, notice that she shall be called, uh, in terms of the language that he uses, even a portion of his own name. She shall be called Isha. His man is Ish. She is Isha. Uh, it's, it's like even what I refer to her as is going to be part of who I am. Even in the naming, the first thing that's ever said in terms of human language in the Bible is talking about an intimacy of, uh, of relationship. Very, very interesting. I don't know if you have any friends that they got married and then they changed their name to Bob and Bobby. Hi, my name's Bob. This is my wife, Bobby. Nice to meet you. I'm Ted. This is my wife, Teddy. Anybody going to do that? No, probably not. But uh, uh, it's the idea that every time he said her or spoke to her, uh, recognize who she was, there would be a recognition of the intimacy of relationship that God intended for them that we see even in the process of how she was taken uh, out of his side. The other thing, and certainly jumps us to the New Testament, there's a purpose in the relationship in terms of the picture of Christ in the church. And we're, if you've um, read the Bible very much at all or heard much on, on teaching on marriages, certainly you're familiar with Ephesians 5 there, Paul. And again, Paul quotes this passage twice, uh, the one we are uh, reading and going over this morning, once in 1 Corinthians and once in Ephesians. Jesus quotes it uh, as well, and, uh, and we'll read a, a portion of that and talk about that in just a moment. But again, very, very critical anytime God repeats himself three times uh, in the word. But uh, notice Paul's point here in Ephesians 5, again, instructions, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So it's a sacrificial love that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. There's our phrase again. And then the quote, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking of Christ and the church. Christ in the church. So our marriages, why it's so important that we live out the biblical mandates and follow these instructions is because we're to be an example of Christ in the church. Jesus said to the church, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So every time that happens, it mars the vision of the world of Christ and his love in a relationship with the church. Every time a husband is not sacrificial towards his wife, it mars the testimony and the vision that Christ is sacrificial. Every time a husband is not loving his wife unconditionally, it, it mars uh, and takes away the testimony that would, uh, uh, that would uh, be there uh, otherwise. Every time a wife is not respectful to her husband in her words and her attitudes, it mars the testimony and the relationship the church is to have with Jesus Christ. So this is much more than this idea, and I'll read a great quote at the end here from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the idea that marriage is, is so elevated in God's eyes, and it's been, therefore, understandably, so diminished and so attacked by Satan because he does not want this image and this picture of Christ and the church out there in the real world where people can really, really see it. We could also say, even in the process of Adam and Eve, that Adam is put into a deep sleep, and then out of his side actually comes Eve. In the same way, in this picture of Jesus Christ, he's put into a deep sleep on the cross. His side is pierced, and we could say outflowed the church uh, because of his death and his resurrection. So it's a, it's a very important picture, uh, one that, uh, that we see in the very inception of this first marriage relationship. The fourth thing, and here's where we get the principles for marriage in verses 24 and 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. 
and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So uh, again here, the idea of these basic principles of a healthy marriage. Now it's in 1 Corinthians 7, just to say that God is, uh, that there Paul esteems the idea of being single. Not everybody's called to be uh, married, uh, and, uh, and he extols the advantages of being single in terms of being able to serve the Lord. But certainly here's, here's the picture and here's the norm in terms of uh, a marriage or relationship. The first principle is to leave, to forsake all other relationships. Now, th this is interesting given the context in a sense that we've got the first thing, here's what God says, here's what God says, here's what God does, and then suddenly you've got man speaking for the very first time, and then you've got Moses going, and therefore, and he makes the statement then, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. Now, that's very interesting in context in a Middle Eastern mindset uh, that uh, they were in that uh, we're probably more familiar with because we're so Asian influenced here. We're very familiar with the idea that the young couple gets married and then, and then that guy, that young guy builds onto his father's house so they have a place to live. That's the way it was done in Moses' day, a tent for at first, later a building. Uh, and that's what we do a lot here, very common, this idea of multi-generational homes. So it's, this is kind of startling then. For, for Mo, this is Moses' first commentary uh, on this idea of marriage. Because of what God says, therefore, this is what should happen. And we were talking about this after our uh, last teaching there from Dr. Wilkerson on this idea of leaving. And, of course, his emphasis there is that sometimes you physically need, need to leave. So what, what is really being spoken about here? Well, really, the issue is one of loyalty and intimacy, and to have that, you need to leave. Uh, your loyalty, that young guy, that young gal, whatever age they might be, as they stand before God and friends and family uh, in an open uh, situation where they can declare their love and their commitment to one another, they are pledging now that their loyalty is now to for her to that guy, that young guy, and no longer to her parents. He is pledging that his first loyalty is no longer to his father and mother, but it's to her. The priorities of his life will all change. All other relationships become secondary. Certainly they still honor mother and father. Certainly uh, you have friends and so forth. But in terms of, of, of time, provision, and what your life is about, it's now all about that marriage relationship. Now, in part, <laughs> you, you may uh, uh, li live in the, in, the, in the cottage behind or the apartment built on or the, uh, if you're really struggling financially, the tent in the backyard, whatever it might be, with your parents. But sometimes it's difficult to do that because of the sin of the parents because they want to have continued control uh, over, over little Johnny or little Susie or whoever it might be. Uh, and that's a sin. And uh, what Moses is saying is that if you don't leave and change this, this uh, loyalty that you have, then you'll never be able to cleave. And if you can't do that, you'll never experience the oneness that God has for you. So it becomes a criti critical issue. Uh, we were uh, just, uh, Kathy and I were talking about one of the uh, young guys that, uh, that we knew that uh, had graduated a little bit ago from his uh, UPT and got, uh, got a C-17, which he was thrilled about, kid from Kaneohe here. And, uh, and he had two options then. He must have, he must have been number one in his, uh, his classroom pilot training because they offered him Hickam and they offered him McCourt. Could have come back home, a local kid, after four years at academy and a couple years of pilot training. But he just got married. Local girl. They picked McCord. <laughs> they went to Washington State for the sake of the marriage because he knew it would be trouble. He knew it would be parents wanting to influence and call the shots and give direction, and they knew that their marriage would be better off to physically leave and live 3,000 miles away as much as they love their parents and love Hawaii. I thought for a young guy that was pretty insightful. I'm sure it bum bummed out their, uh, their parents on, on both sides. Uh, but this is so critical at the beginning that we're able to leave. Uh, sometimes the problem is the couple itself, but usually the problem really comes from the parents. Uh, very critical. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. It's a, it's a command or issue or foundation of loyalty. And then to cleave. 
or joined or be united, different translations, speaks of permanence. It's the same word in the Hebrew that's used when two pieces of wood are actually glued together. So marriage is meant to be permanent. And of course, when it no longer is and divorce comes, then that which God glued together, like that piece of wood, there's only one way to get it apart, and it's ripped and it's torn. You don't get the... You don't get that clean joint again when you pull those two pieces of wood apart. That wood glue, once it's clamped, really works. It's very difficult. So there's lots of pain that, uh, that uh, goes on. And prob there's probably nobody in the room that has not seen that, either through their lives or parents or friends or whatever. It's so prevalent in, in our, our society. It wasn't at one time. People really understood this for a very long period of, of, of time. Uh, your parents, your grandparents, if you go back even a couple of generations, there was very little divorce that took place. It just wasn't done. It wasn't culturally accepted. Some people understood it as a biblical mandate. Other people didn't. They just knew it was kind of a principle that whatever happens, whatever comes your way in your relationship, you, you stick it out. You find a way. You weather the storm. You make changes. You do what you got to do. But there's no other option, so you just got to work it out. And if you have that attitude, then you do. Those things happen. I remember Kathy and I were meeting and praying with uh, one of the couples that have been part of the church for a number of years. And uh, they came to us and, you know, they said all kind of problems and this and that. And they're fighting, yelling, screaming and so forth. And uh, we met a couple of times. And then uh, finally, the, the wife said, listen, we just think that we're better off and the kids are better off for us just to end this relationship. Uh, because we feel bad because we're, we're yelling and screaming at each other to all hours. And so I, I said, uh, well, you're, I can tell you one thing. Your kids are not better off. Your kids are better off with you staying in the home, yelling and screaming at each other. Just try to keep it down after 10 o'clock at night so somebody can get some sleep. But just stay there and keep screaming long enough. Eventually, maybe somebody will start praying, and this thing will turn a corner. But your kids will not be better off by ending the relationship. In fact, they will be damaged uh, tremendously. A lot of young guys that go through that don't recover until their early 30s, so sociologists tell us. Uh, kids are not resilient, and it does hurt them, and it is difficult. And again, many in this room have experienced that on one end or the other. But the whole point is what they did is they, they, they said, are you, are you telling me that we should stay for the sake of our kids? And I said, yes, absolutely. I don't care if you hate each other's guts. Just stay there uh, and keep praying and stay there for the sake of your kids and raise your kids. Well, it was interesting. It wasn't more than two months later that they came to us and said, we seem to have turned a corner. Oh, really? How did that happen? Oh, he changed. I asked him, no, she changed. Uh, and it's like, no. I, what I think happened is they made a commitment right then and understood that their marriage was going to be permanent no matter what. And that, uh, that just made a huge difference in their ability and commitment to kind of work things out, find a way to forgive, begin talking on a, on a new level. It's very critical. Jesus, in debating with the Pharisees in his day, because one rabbi, Hillel, had developed a teaching that said, if your wife displeased you in any way, you could divorce her. If she burned your eggs in the morning, then you could just go down and write a certificate of divorce. And I'm not kidding. It was, very, it was prevalent in Jesus' day. It was a terrible thing. And he's debating with them over this issue of what God meant. And he quotes our passage. And this is in Matthew 19 and verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus says when a couple marries, they should not separate. And uh, very, very critical. We've really lost this idea of permanence in our, uh, in our relationships. And then they're to be, become one and they shall become one flesh. It's talking about the couple, certainly their physical relationship, but I think it's got a far deeper meaning uh, than that. But certainly in terms of the sexual relationship, God is the designer. He thought the whole thing up. He knows our emotional ma makeup. He knows what brings satisfaction. He also knows what brings destruction. That's interesting. Every sociological study that I'm aware of that's ever been done shows that 
couples that are couples of faith and believe in the permanence of the relationship and remain faithful to each other have far better sex than anybody that, uh, that's on the other side of the thing. That's, uh, uh, God designed it. He set the whole thing up. And in our uh, last marriage uh, series that we did with Mark Gunger, of course, two of the sections, sessions was how to have great sex. So I'm sorry if you missed that. I don't, there's not really a makeup course for that. But uh, uh, it's, it's really true. And that's what we find out that uh, those men and women that have multiple partners and other relationships of intimacy prior to marriage are the same ones that have problems in terms of having intimacy once they are married. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just it's, uh, happening all, all over our, our culture because of the, uh, quote, the uh, sexual liberation of the 60s and so forth, the mindset that goes along with that. There's lots of problems that people have out there uh, as a result, God's intent is that we become one flesh. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Sin affects us in terms of our relationship with the Lord, but apparently sexual sin affects us in a different way. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 16. He says, Don't you know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? That's, I, again, this idea of oneness. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee sexual immorality. Every man that sins, uh, every, uh, every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom uh, you were... Uh, in you whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So sexual sins affect us deeper. Paul says other sins are outside the body. But sexual sin is in the body. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're becoming one with a harlot in that sense. And there's a dynamic that's going on that changes something in you in terms of your very core and your very being. And he says it's, uh, it's different. Uh, there's something uh, that uh, happens there that doesn't happen uh, in, other, in other sense. Came across a uh, Chuck Colson Breakpoint article a couple of months ago and, and hung on to it. It says uh, uh, the title is for better or worse, mostly worse, the state of our marital unions. Uh, he says here, Tina wants to get married, but her boyfriend Ted just wants to move in. Ted is an exceptionally honest young man, so here's what he says. Tina, I'm fond of you. I want to live with you for the following reasons. First, it will make it easier for me to enjoy regular sex. Second, I want to protect my assets, assets that uh, I'll have to share uh, with you if we got a divorce. Third, you already have kids, and I don't want to support them. Fourth, I'm waiting for my perfect soulmate to come along, and until I meet her, I'd like to live with you. It's a nice young guy, he's just very honest and everything, you know, appreciate honesty. He goes on, sound convincing? Probably not. Ted's arguments are incredibly insulting, and yet, according to a new study, these are exactly the reasons men want to live with women. Reasons that not only insult women, but make them the big losers on the domestic front. At Rutgers University, researchers with the National Marriage Project have published a report called Why Men Won't Commit, Exploring Young Men's Attitude About Sex, Dating, and Marriage. The study offers up <coughs> the top 10 reasons men are reluctant to say I do. Among them, they can get all the sex they want without marriage. They want to enjoy the single life as long as possible. They want to avoid financial pitfalls of divorce. And they're afraid a marriage will demand too many changes and compromises. Apparently, their live-in girlfriends can get used to their bad habits or leave. Most galling of all is the admission by men that they don't want to marry their girlfriends because they're waiting for their true love to come along. Then they'll tie the knot, buy a home, father kids. Meanwhile, their live-ins can pick up their socks and provide sex on demand. Grandma was right. Men won't buy the cow if they can get the milk free. It's, uh, that's the kind of the state we're in, as we kind of get this lower and lower and lower view of marriage and God's intention, and certainly what he has to say about oneness. 
But oneness is more than that. It speaks about the uniqueness of the relationship uh, in this term, becoming one flesh. What does it really mean? Well, that term is used a couple of times uh, in other texts. In Genesis 29, verse 14, uh, there Laban is talking to his future son-in-law, Jacob. And it says, And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for uh, a month. So it's talking about something more simply than it's not just a physical. It's something more of a dynamic in terms of their family, who they mean to each other. First Chronicles 11.1, 1, talking about when uh, David was going to be uh, crowned king. Then all Israel came together to David at Hebron saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. So it's talking about more than something of a physical nature here. A very similar Greek term is used in Peter's preaching in Acts 2.17, as he's quoting from Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Flesh. Jesus pour, God pours his Holy Spirit out on our, really on our soul and who we are and our spirit if we're born again. It's much more than something physical. So when God says, if you leave and you cleave, then I can make you one flesh, it's really talking about a dynamic where we become joined to that other person in terms of our spirit and in terms of our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions, as well as physical. And therefore, that's why Paul says, when you join yourself together with someone else outside the context of marriage, it's a great sin because you're joining yourself in terms of your soul, your mind, will, and your emotions, your spirit. And he's reminded, and the Holy Spirit lives in you as well as the physical. It is not just a physical relationship. It's so much more than that. And it's meant for the context of marriage. When God makes us one or one people in the context of marriage, it brings a unity that is not possible by another means. Marriage is different. It's different than being a father or a grandfather. Uh, it's different than being a son or a daughter and so forth. It's different than being an aunt or an uncle. It's different than being a friend or a close friend. It is completely unique in a God sight meant to be elevated above all other relationships, only second to our relationship with God himself. And then the last point, uh, the fourth principle, and then to be transparent, verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So certainly uh, the implication is the physical, but the word actually means uh, transparency. So we are to have an openness and honesty. You know, there's, uh, the world can be a pretty harsh place out there. <laughs> the, the critics are there. It's hard to drive on the, on the road sometimes without... Uh, uh, people making hand gestures to you and stuff to, to, to ruin your day. There's got to be a safe harbor, someplace where you can come home at the end of the day and not be judged and not be criticized. And you can be open and you can be transparent with somebody else and share your dreams and your aspirations and what's going on in your life and what's troubling you. Uh, you we, all, we all need that. I realize the gals may need it a little more in terms of the number of words, but we all need that in terms of this transparency and this being able to vent with somebody who is not going to judge, who's not going to criticize and will listen. Uh, and uh, it's, again, part of the foundational. We have to leave. There's a new loyalty. We have to cleave and see it as a permanence. And there's a uniqueness to the oneness that God will bring in our relationships and there needs to be a transparency that we can have and enjoy with one another. And when we don't do that, we're trespassing against basic principles that God meant for our marriages. Because after all, they are meant to be not only enjoyed by us, but to be a picture of Christ and the church. Well, here's the, uh, the quote from uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And again, this is from uh, a wedding uh, sermon from prison. Uh, uh, keeping in mind Bonhoeffer chose to leave New York, go back to Germany to minister uh, to, to his church, of which he was a pastor, because he would speak out against Nazism and the, uh, the Holocaust and the horrific things that uh, Hitler was doing, was eventually imprisoned and then was, uh, was uh, killed uh, about uh, just a few days before the end of World War II. Uh, one of the sermons, again, uh, speaking of marriage and a wedding, uh, reads as follows. He says, marriage is more than your love for each other. It has a, highly, a higher dignity and power, for it is God's holy ordinance. 
through which he wills to perpetuate the human race till the end of time. In your love, you see only your two selves in the world. But in marriage, you are a link in the chain of the generations, which God causes to come and to pass away to his glory and calls into his kingdom. In your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness. But in marriage, you are placed at a post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession, but marriage is more than something personal. It's a status, an office, just as it is the crown and not merely the will to rule that makes the king, so it is marriage and not merely your love for each other that joins you together in the sight of God and man. As high as God is above man, so high are the sanctity, the rights, and the promise of marriage above the sanctity the rights and the promise of love. It is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. You know, you can love somebody very privately, and you could tell somebody that you love them, but that's different than say, will you marry me? And then that's different between standing in front of others and making that commitment and entering into that covenant. And I love that line that it becomes an office, a post that you stand at. It's no longer a private thing, it's a public thing because of what you've done. And therefore, most marriages, and should be, are very public and in front of others and families and, uh, and, and friends. The idea of a private wedding is of a very new thing in terms of the history of, uh, of, of mankind. But again, it's, I love the line that um, it is not your love that sustains the marriage. From now on, the marriage sustains the love because your love ebbs and flows because it's so feeling oriented. But if you're committed to the principles that God lays out and you enjoy the oneness that he means to have, then there's something there worth hanging on to, fighting for, and going through whatever storms the life and the devil may throw at you. And there's a lot of them that are out there because we live now in a culture that is very anti-family and anti-marriage. And, and we've got Satan and his attacks against us. And Plus, it's just plain hard anyway sometimes, <laughs> even if you didn't have all, all of that stuff going for you. Uh, and so we need to see that this is a, such a high calling and not allowed what the world has to say about marriage to affect us. Yeah, Socrates may have said it a long time ago. People still may believe that, that somehow that uh, if you get married and you get a good wife, you're going to be happy. And if you don't, you'll become a philosopher. But God uh, doesn't agree with that and means you to have so much more. Again, it's not finding the perfect person. It's becoming that person once you are married. And we need the work of the Holy Spirit, God's grace to help us in the process. And we need to pray for each other, pray for our marriages, because they are a picture of Christ in the church. Amen. Amen.